called Basin Updating of Statistical Parameters and the Probability Models for Ice Peak Loads. So uh, this is now uh, based on the previous study which was presented in the last workshop, uh, one of the examples. And uh, uh, the objective is to present some probabilistic models for peak ice loads acting on a ship in Arctic areas. Also illustrate uh, Basin Updating of Statistical Parameters for a simplistic data set just to make it more transparent, and also based on updating for mixture of different models, which are members of a selected model space or model universe. Uh, so this is similar to what we have also heard from Costas earlier, where there was different models which are competing to get most likelihood or, or uh, the highest uh, uh, plausibility. So, um, also, to compute probability of failure for a fixed capacity threshold for different probability models based on the posterior distribution functions. So it's to illustrate um, the, this Bayesian updating procedure. So now the, the data which was behind this study was uh, from an expedition with the Coast Guard vessel Svalbard in 2007. And uh, this is the uh, fiber optic sensors on, on the internal frames. So there are uh, five, uh, four frames in the front, in the bow area, which are instrumented, and then there's one frame in the midship, but most of the ice peak, uh, peak loads will occur in the bow area, bow area typically. This is now the route of the, the ship. Uh, so I, I guess you know where Svalbard is. It's up in the far, uh, far north in the Arctic. And this is now how you can use the, the measurements to estimate the load. It's based on shear uh, deformation. So you can, based on estimation of shear forces, you can estimate the external load. So this is now the local loading between two frames. So it's a line load estimation. So this is, and this is what the uh, typical record looks like. You have a lot of these peaks and uh, the intensity is pretty high, so we see that the scale on the horizontal axis is like five minutes between each of the marks. 7.55 in the morning, 8 in the morning, 8.05 in the morning, and so on. So we see we have a lot of impacts on the hull during uh, even five minutes. So now what is the statistical model for this process? And uh, the data, they show uh, like uh, two uh, statistical Populations, in a way, you see the upper uh, upper data. They are due to the hard inclusions in ice, so they they show a different slope, a smaller slope than the, for the lower part where you have most of the data. So, if you try to fit a straight line, we see that it misses the the what is happening in extreme cases where you really where you have interest if you want to calculate the the extreme loading. Anyway, fatigue is different, but for extreme loading, it's the upper parts the hard inclusions that really matter. So uh, that means you should really um, fit two slopes. So if you're using, for example, an exponential model, you need a mixed model with two slopes and some mixing coefficient for the exponential uh, part. Now, this is what you also can, can get if you lose, use a single exponential model. You have the lambda, the intensity parameter of the exponential it depends on the ice thickness, so you can plot this as a function of the ice thickness, and we see there's a large scatter, but there's some decreasing trend. That means the, the thicker the ice, the, the, the smaller the, the uh, intensity or the lambda parameter of the exponential. Now, also, uh, the variable is much applied for, uh, for ice peak loading, and um, uh, this is now the, then you have, of course, two parameters. This is a two-parameter variable, so we have the scale and the shape parameters, k and theta. So now they will also uh, have a more flexibility to fit a set of data. And they also show some trend. If you compare with the ice thickness, they have some, some tendency to change with the, with the ice thickness. And um, then um, this, is, uh, this is the same, so we... Uh, this is now the third one, which is the, the three-parameter exponential. So we see that uh, now we have the three parameters. We have the mixture coefficient. We have the lambda one. We have lambda two. And uh, uh, this is very much applied in uh, 
design of ships, they use the T-parameter, but in fact, they only use the upper part because that's what matters. So you frequently see one parameter exponential, but it's only the upper part which are the, the, the highest loading. So that is applied for design. And then you have the other uh, community which are applying the viable distribution. So in a way, there are two schools in, the, in the, uh, this uh, branch um, to, to use two different approaches to, uh, to estimation of extreme values. The one is the viable, one is the upper slope for the exponential distribution. But this is now the true mixture distribution. If you want to, to use fatigue analysis, you will need the t-parameter exponential to look at that. Now, we look at Bayesian updating and we look at three different probability models. One is the exponential, one is the exponential with the upper tail data, uh, then we have the viable, and then there's a combination of these because you can start with the possibility that s these three models are all possible models, so you don't say that to exclude any of them. We say, we say that they're equally probable to start with, and then you, you look at the data to see what the data tells you about which model is the best one. And uh, then also we look at probability of failure for fixed threshold, and uh, we apply a simplistic data set to make it more transparent. So I have picked nine samples, which are representative for the line loads on the, on the bow area. So we have from 33 kilonewton per meter and up to 195. And uh, this is now uh, for the exponential. We see that this is exponential probability paper. We see we have basically straight line is fitted. And uh, so the slope is 0 0.0123 for the, the fitted regression uh, line. And that means the lambda becomes 0 0.0123 for the regression uh, parameter estimation. And we also see we have the lower part is, is a high slope. The upper part is a smaller slope. So clearly we see that the data uh, does not fit very well to, to the upper part of the model and it doesn't fit too well to the lower part of the model. But on average, it fits quite well. But uh, then uh, we look at the, the, uh, the uh, posterior distribution of the, for this case, and now we have a, a uniform prior. So we take the uh, uniform between the lambda max and lambda min and uh, then we look at the posterior distribution and the, the uh, uniform distribution disappears because it occurs both the normalizing factor and the, the, uh, the nominator. So that means we end up with a, with a normalization factor and then the exponential term, which is, is a summation of the sample and also a product of, uh, of the lambda parameters. So now this is a posterior shown as a function of lambda and then we can see that we have the peak, which corresponds now to the max likelihood estimator because we have uniform prior. And normalization factor constant is uh, very small here. So uh, this is now the unnormalized one. So this is what you get after you, you divide by the normalization factor. Now, if you only pick the upper part of the data, the three highest uh, values, you get a different posterior, and you see that now the lambda estimator, the max likelihood, is smaller. It's now closer to 0.01. And normalization constant is very different, 2.8 times 10 to minus 10 for this case. Then we look at the viable model, and uh, this is the PDF, and we have also prior, which is uniform between now two limits. It's one for the shape, one for the scale uh, parameter. Likelihood function is uh, a bit more complex. You have products involving the two parameters, and you can also plot now the posterior PDF for this one, and the normalization factor now is uh, 0.38 times 10 to minus 18, very small also. And uh, we see again that we have a peak which corresponds to the max likelihood estimator for S and uh, the, the shape and the scale parameter. So this is now the, the peak of this uh, posterior density function, also, since also here we have uniform prior, prior distributions. Then we can look at the extreme values based on the posterior, and uh, the, uh, the, here we use the, the basic initial distribution, and then we exponent, uh, exp take the exponent to the nth power because they assume independence. And this can now be approximated for, for large n, which we have here, by uh, exponential expression, and then we can also introduce the posterior distribution and we, then we get the probability of failure conditional 
on the shape and uh, the, the scale parameters, and this is now the posterior probability of failure. And uh, then we, we uh, can integrate. So this is now for the exponential, and this is for the variable. We can now, this is conditional on the parameters, but then we also combine with the likelihood function, and we get the exponential case to the, to the left. You see that there is an increasing probability of failure for small and smaller lambda. And for the upper tail, it's the same, but we have, of course, different uh, shapes. You have different uh, maximum values. For the uh, upper tail, we have a maximum of five, and for the other one, we have a very small maximum value of the uh, probability of failure, conditional probability of failure. Now, this is for the two-parameter model. We see that we also have increasing probability of failure for lower shape and for higher scale, which is not uh, unreasonable. This is what you would expect. So you see that the reason you stop here is that you have a, a, um, a uniform prior, which is uh, limited. You have an upper and lower limit on the parameters. Now, you can also look at the unconditional probability of failure by integrating away the, the uh, uh, parameter uh, lambda for one case, and then you have the variable for the other case, and you see that we get very different values of the probability of failure. One is for the exponential, 10 to minus 8, for the exponential upper tail, 10 to minus 3, and for the variable, 1 times 10 to minus 3, which are, is comparable to the upper tail exponential. So. Uh, they give uh, quite good correspondence for the two, for the exponential upper tail and the variable, but the exponential with a single parameter on all data are, is not so good. Then you can also look at combination of different probability models based on base and updating. We have seen these formulations by Costas earlier. So the traditional Bayesian parameter updating is the upper uh, expression. The lower one is if you have combination of probabilistic models, M, J, with different a priori probabilities. Then you can find the joint posterior of the parameter vector and the model, and then you can integrate away the parameter vector. So that means you can look at the marginal posterior of the model, and you can also do the same if you have a continuous parameter model space, sorry. So the lower expression is for the case where the, the model space is continuous. That means you have, for example, a structural model with the continuous parameter. And now looking at putting these uh, numbers into these expressions, we, we try first with the, the prior probabilities for combination of all three distributions. We have one third on each of them, and we see that for this small data set, the posterior um, probabilities, they become binary because the, the different normalization factors, so the, the exponential tail gets all the weight, the others two get zero. If you start with the exponential and the variable with 0.5, then the variable gets all the attention, exponential zero. If you start with the upper tail and variable with 0.5, then you end up with the, the upper tail exponential and zero for the variable. And this is now due to the different magnitudes of the normalization factors, but also probably due to the very small data set. So if you increase the data set, uh, this might become more not so binary as for this case. Now for the resulting failure probabilities, they also comply with the weighting of the different uh, probabilistic uh, models. So for the only exponential, you get 10 to 2 times 10 to minus 8, as we mentioned, then for the Combination of all three distributions, 3.1 times 10 to minus 3, and for the exponential variable, 1.0, 10 to minus 3, and then for the exponential upper tail and variable, uh, you get the same as or having all the three models uh, in, in your toolbox at the same time in your model universe. So we see that uh, when you look at different candidates for statistical models, of course, you should not start with a single one. You should have different alternatives, and then they will... Uh, get weights, posterior weights, according to the data that you have. Of course, you also have other ways of looking at comparing different probabilistic models like regression coefficients or chi-square tests and all that, but this is now 
for the Bayesian approach and then for the small data set. But uh, what will happen is, is to look at larger data sets and see how these numbers will, will change for, for a larger data set than just uh, nine points. Yeah, summary of results. Um, this is just what we went through. So, um, uh, conclusions that um, we have looked at different probabilistic models, rise loads, and based on updating is performed for a simple, uh, simplistic data set. The annual probability for a fixed capacity threshold is computed for different models and a mixture of different models, which are members of the model universe. They are assessed by posterior probabilities. And for the present data set, there's a strong ranking of the three models based on the posterior probability with binary type of probabilities. And this is now also what was presented uh, last time. We see that the extreme values, long-term extreme values, based on really real measured data, we have now the, the uh, upper tail or the t-parameter exponential is to the right. And then the, the, the green one is the Weibull, then the single exponential is the yellow uh, to, uh, points to the left, and we have different return periods, and again we see that the three-parameter exponential will give higher predictions of the extreme loads than the other two models. So clearly the, the overall data also seem to indicate that the three-parameter Weibull, or the upper tail, sorry, three-parameter exponential, upper tail exponential is uh, very good model for the peak, uh, peak ice lows to predict extremes. <coughs> so these are now the three models, one exponential, two viable, uh, three, three parameter exponential. And uh, we also see we have return periods of one year, five year, and 20 years. And the tendency is the same for all, them, all of these, of course. Uh, and this, uh, if you look at the factors, the, the viable predict six, for the 20 year extreme. The uh, three parameter exponential predicts 1061, which is almost a factor of over 40% higher than the viable prediction. So, uh, concluding remarks we looked at the initial parent distribution of the ice peak load process based on updating of parameters, based on updating for the plausibilities or credibilities of the different models, and also posterior failure probabilities for a fixed threshold based for the peak ice load. And uh, I should mention the, the threshold is uh, 12 and a half times the, the minimum lambda value. So that is a pretty high threshold and that is to get the probabilities of failure of a, of a proper order of magnitude. And that means uh, also the design of the ship would uh, clearly satisfy uh, that threshold and even even higher design thresholds to get get the sound ship hull traveling in Arctic uh, waters. So, uh, thank you for your attention. <laughs>